F. Clements, who is the Tom Paine on this critical question for our democracy, the Tom Paine, the lawyer uh, for the courts. I mean, his brief, there are 40 plus briefs that were filed uh, in this current round of argument in this case. His is the most important. Uh, it, I, I urge you all to read it. It goes to that elephant in the room uh, in this matter, which is whether or not corporations shall be treated as persons under the First Amendment. These artificial entities with state-based advantages, whether or not they shall be treated as persons with free speech rights that you and I have as individual human beings. That's the crux of the matter, and that's what his brief focuses on. Now, I agree that, uh, you know, this court could do a lot of things that doesn't have to involve it going over the cliff here. It could read this matter much more narrowly. Uh, it, it could focus solely on this idea of whether this is a, uh, you know, a movie and not electioneering and so forth. Uh, but if it goes over the cliff, uh, then this is a critical moment uh, for our uh, democracy because it really will radically reshape our politics uh, and, and the way we conduct business in the political process. Let's take for the moment uh, the, the notion that the top Fortune 100 companies would be able to now participate using their general treasury funds in the political process. What would that mean? Well, last year, in this last 2008 cycle, political parties spent a total of $1.5 billion. And political action committees, which are, of course, committees formed by individuals that want to put money in, some small, some large, corporate PACs exist, as well as union PACs and so forth. These political action committees spend $1.2 billion combined. What about the Fortune 100 companies? How much money and profit did they make in this past year? $600 billion. So the amount of money that they would have access to, just those top 100 companies, in order to spend the political process dwarfs by any stretch of the imagination the kind of money that already we see being spent in the political process, that already is far too beyond, uh, too, too far beyond the ordinary citizen reach. And, and that's really what's at stake here. You know, when we consider that the Exxon and the Chevron can, can spend the kind of money in the totality that has been spent uh, combined by all candidates, by all parties, by Barack Obama and John McCain, that's what's uh, at stake. So I think that's why so many people are alarmed uh, by what's being discussed here before the Supreme Court, whether it will in fact go back and overturn long-standing precedent, century-old precedent, going back to the 1907 Tillman Act, which bars corporations from giving directly to candidates, whether they will go ahead and just unleash this torrent of corporate money into our elections and, and drown out ordinary citizen speech as we know it. Now, you know, some of you may know that while I was at the National Voting Rights Institute, uh, where we litigated some of these campaign finance questions, we focused, among other things, on the Buckley v. Vallejo decision. This was a 1976 ruling, which effectively equated money with speech in the political process. And gave us the current system of unlimited campaign spending. Congress had, in the wake of the Watergate scandal in 1974, enacted a series of reforms to try to rein in uh, the kind of cash and, and, you know, that was flowing through the Nixon White House and all the circumstances surrounding that. And those reforms included mandatory campaign spending limits. And the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, which is the second most important court in the land, and the Supreme Court being, of course, the first, uh, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals upheld those limits on the grounds that Congress had the right to regulate the, the election process and ensure that every voice could get heard on an equal uh, basis and that no one should have the right to drown out other people's speech. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals got it right. The Supreme Court, unfortunately, got it wrong and reversed that opinion and allowed the kind of unlimited campaign spending we see today. I raise that because as much as I believe that that Supreme Court ruling was wrong, this one, if it is going to go in the wrong direction, 
uh, will be far, far worse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that, that, that one is, is a matter that continues to be of major debate, and we actually brought uh, a few cases through the courts, one of which reached the Supreme Court, and they reaffirmed uh, the holding in Buckley. But this one has the threat uh, that, that comes with it of unleashing this corporate money into the political process, and that's what I think is so dangerous here. Now, what I'd like to do, and then you know, open it up to discussion, is 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 raise one strategy among others that we as citizens uh, can push forward to essentially fight back. And I and I should say, you know, just to, just to clarify here, the Supreme Court heard argument already in this case, Citizens United v. FEC. They they already heard the round of argument. Uh, that gets granted when they take up a case. What they've done is they've asked for re-argument that's being heard tomorrow on a specific question which was not necessarily pushed by any of the parties in this case. They've asked for re-argument as to whether or not the Austin v. Michigan Chamber of Commerce decision and the McConnell v. FEC decision should be overturned. That's the, that's the question before the courts before the Supreme Court tomorrow. They've invited this new briefing, which is why Jeff has filed this brief on behalf of these organizations, why 40 plus other uh, briefs have been filed, is because the Supreme Court has gone out of the way to invite re-argument on this specific question. And to put it bluntly, it's the re-argument as to whether or not we should go back to pre-1907 and overturn long-standing century-old precedent that prohibits corporations from spending money in political campaigns. That's really what they've asked for re-argument in. So knowing that that's what they've done, and I hope they, they step back from the brink and, and they don't go over it, but knowing that that's what they've done, it, it does, for us, I think, raise the question of whether or not we need to put on the table now the notion that we have to formally amend the Constitution to state clearly that corporations shall not be treated as persons under the First Amendment and do not have the free speech rights that individual human beings have under the First Amendment. That's the question, I think, that ought to now be put on the table. I agree with Jeff. I hope ultimately it doesn't become necessary to amend the Constitution because I agree that there's no need to uh, read into the Constitution the notion that corporations uh, have uh, these kinds of First Amendment rights. And, and in fact, the courts have already uh, read that to be the case when it comes to prohibiting the, general, the spending of general treasury uh, funds. Uh, but if they're going down this road, then I think we need to push back with that challenge. And, and I think that kind of amendment strategy would invite the, the broad public discussion that ought to happen as to what do we want our Constitution to protect. Do we want it to protect uh, just us as individual citizens, or do we want it to extend uh, to corporations? And when we see what's happened in uh, just the recent uh, months and, 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 and year, two years, with respect to the power uh, of the banks, the power of the health care lobby, we see the danger of corporate dominance in our political process, just in our current politics today, and we can only imagine uh, what that danger will will be if the court uh, does the wrong thing here. Uh, so I think that we ought to consider that amendment strategy. I think that's a tool for pushing back against uh, what the court may be doing. And finally, I, I would just say, you know, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, came before the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, when he had his confirmation and talked about the importance of obeying precedent <laughs> and, and following uh, prior uh, court rulings. And that often is what a uh, nominated uh, individual to be on the Supreme Court or even for a lower court uh, will say at a confirmation hearing. But in addition, there's been this claim that he is of the wing that doesn't believe in activist uh, judicial decision making. And yet, going down this road is probably the most activist judicial uh, decision making that that one can think, to take an issue that wasn't really before this court, that has not been presented in the factual record below, and to take it up and to now invite this kind of briefing, 
demonstrates the, the danger and the kind of activism that may be going on on the part of that wing of the court. But I hope they hear the alarm from, from around the country. I hope they read carefully all these briefs, obviously including Jeff's, and, and step back. At the, at the same time, if they don't do it now, they may do it later. And so we have to be prepared to articulate why the First Amendment should not apply uh, to corporations, should only apply to individuals. Thank you.